as a pilot. It's all about planning and planning and planning. And there's one particular instance when I, as a pilot as well, believe that sometimes I get pretty anxious. And that instance is just before we take off and fly into the sky. When air traffic controllers tell us, line up and wait. Now, I'll tell you why it's very important. At this particular time, before this line up and wait position, before we're, we're at the runway, we're going to come up, we're going to take off. Pilots have done all that checklist, and I tell you, there are a million of them. We have to make sure, as the captain, the co-pilot, cross-check all the data. They have to talk with the cabin crew to make sure that passengers have put off their handphones, not playing with it, put it in airplane mode, or worn their seat belts. Everything is done, it's ready. We've done all the planning, we've done all the preparation, we've done everything we could, make sure everything is as safe as possible. But we're still not taking off yet because the air traffic controllers tell us, just line up and wait. And I want you to remember this because it's actually quite important and we'll get through it a little bit later. But first, let me tell you a story. My name is Johan Farid Paradin, hence my initials JFK. Now, I was born in Johor Bahru, raised in Kuala Lumpur, in a place called Pekaliling Flats, which some young people have absolutely no idea. I was raised by my mother, uh, the late Mrs. Marsha Ann Joseph and Nicholas. I love her, I miss her, and she, when I was three years old, she bought me a book. This book I kept so close to me, I, I slept with it, I ate with it, I pretty much spent my whole day with it. When I was three years old, it was a book of an aeroplane, and it just had pictures of the undercarriage, the wing, and my first word, I think, was pilot, or it probably was wing, because ever since the age of three, I wanted to fly an aeroplane. But I had three really, really big challenges. Number one, money. It's not cheap to go to flying school, believe me now. And when your mother is working in a factory, trying to make ends meet, she's raising one child with no help, bless her soul. Um, I couldn't go to her and say, Mom, can I have a million ringgit to go to flying school, right? The second big challenge, I wouldn't say problem, because problems are like close-ended. If you have a problem, it feels as if it's the end. But if you have a challenge, you're accepting and you know that it's, it's, there's a possibility that you can actually open up to it. So the second challenge I faced was, I couldn't do well in school. I'll tell you why. Back during my time, the syllabus in school was in Bahasa. And English being my mother tongue, pun intended, the only subject I could actually understand in school, you guessed it, was English. <laughs> Mathematics, Bahasa. Physics, never went through it because not too smart to go into that class of three. <laughs> Suddenly ended up in a cooking class, which is like, Bahasa? So you could tell at this point, that was my second biggest challenge. The third big challenge for me was, hmm, if I don't have the money, maybe I could seek an airline scholarship or become a cadet, or maybe join the Air Force. Maybe, I don't know. But being in the Air Force or signing up to it, for example, you needed perfect eyesight, apparently. You had to have 20-20 vision. I wore glasses, were blind as a bat. So these were the three <laughs> biggest challenges I faced. Now I told myself, I said, okay, with all these three challenges, I still want to be a pilot. I still want to fly an airplane. I still want to be that guy that, that you know, makes little iron wings fly. What could I do? I told myself, okay, I want to maybe find the money myself. And whatever I earn, I'll put half of it to a small piggy bank to start at least somewhere. So I asked myself, what could I do? I liked singing. I was in a small R&B a cappella group in school because I was not really studying. <laughs> so I started my career as a singer. Uh, you may recognize some of these faces. I love them to bits. It's been a few years. Uh, from a group singer in an a cappella and R&B group, I went solo. I then delved into music by becoming a songwriter, music producer. I composed songs for some of the biggest local artists in Malaysia like Shima Majid, Anwar Zain, Dayan Rufa'iza. And then after that, I managed to get a radio. I was on radio on multiple stations. I loved broadcasting. I loved to talk. 
didn't really require any uh, subjects in school, <laughs> but I got it. And from radio, I moved to television. I hosted some of the biggest shows on Malaysian TV networks. From television, I got invited to do shows, become MCs, masters of ceremonies. I conducted like events. I love that. And all this time, while I was doing this part time, I was actually secretly working with the Astro All Asian Networks as well as the regional head for youth network program. I developed youth networks in Southeast Asia. I developed a team community which turned into a business, and the United Nations recognized that and gave me the award of the United Nations Youth Ambassador for Southeast Asia. It was, it was fantastic. I was living the life. I was, I was there. I had the money. I felt money in the sense where I was comfortable. Um, I had recognition. I had validation. I, I, was, I was living it all. I, I, was, I was there. But I was not content because it was not my dream. I, I'm here. It's not my dream. So, what happened in uh, a little under 2009, after 15 years in the entertainment and broadcast industries? I quit. I used every single cent I have and went to Australia to learn to fly an airplane. Because in Malaysia, you were required to have this particular certificate which said that you passed or had a certain credit in, in um, an SPM, which I had one A in English, that's really about it. So. <laughs> I had to go to Australia, get my airline transport pilot's license from Australia, come back to Malaysia, convert that to a Malaysian pilot license, which means that they said, okay, we, don't, we accept you, but you have to do the conversion course to become a Malaysian pilot, fantastic, but you have to do all the exam papers all over again. <laughs> I did it, and I passed. I've got my license, and then, of course, absolutely no job. <laughs> so I went back, and I became as humble as I could, and I said, it's OK, what could I do? I, I flew small airplanes. I took celebrities, personalities, friends of mine from the radio, from television. I flew them around KL City and, and clocked my hours to gain the experience to just show people around town, but also getting those flying hours. At one point in that time, after about a year and a half of doing that flying, I got a call from a regional airline saying, hey, you've got some experience, come join us. I said, fine, thank you. After two years with that airline, I managed to join the world's best low-cost carrier in 2013. And today, I am the senior first officer for the AirAsia X fleet on the A330. That's uh, me right there. And also, the second thing I'm really working on is I've started a tech startup. I'm also doing business and entrepreneurship for an app which I will be launching very soon. The third thing that I do, I'm doing right now is I'm giving motivational talks, hence why I'm here. I'm also a loving husband, which sometimes I wonder if my wife really, really loves me. <laughs> but anyway, I'm also a proud father of now a three-year-old. His name is Aidan Malik, and I just asked him last week, what do you want to be when you grow up? Because I was three years old, and I wanted to be a pilot. I, you know, I was hoping he could be maybe, he could be anything he wants, a captain, a co-pilot, a senior first officer, a cruise relief pilot, he could be anything he wants. He wants to be Spider-Man. So out of all this, right, I, I've, I've learned some things which worked for me, which I want to share with you, which will probably work for you as well. And there are 10 points which I have lived from the day I first started singing until this very day, because I still don't think I'm where I am and where I want to be. I've, I'm living my dreams, yes, but there's still a lot more I can achieve. There's a lot more I can learn. There's a lot more I want to do. And if you have a dream, all right, Here's a little uh, checklist for you. If you want to become pilots of your life all of a sudden, here's the checklist. The first thing I recommend you to do is identify what you want in life. What are you good at? What are you creatively loving every single day? That's number one. Because if you're going to do something for the rest of your life, you better darn well love doing it, right? Once you've identified it, the second thing you could is pretty much, what do you think? Is to visualize achieving your goals. Uh, literally. Every single day, right, if you think about it, right, you have your goals. Now you want to visualize it. So you wake up. You haven't achieved your dreams yet, but you go and <coughs> dream about it. You think about it. You keep on doing it every single day. 
And that's what I did. At three years old, I wanted to dream of becoming a pilot. So I woke up thinking about it. As, as I age, I'm not too young now. I'm still doing it, right? Visualize your, 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 your dreams. Third thing is to wake up with positivity. I love this part. Wake up with positivity, irrespective if I wake up on the left side of the bed or the right side of the bed and my wife kicks me off the bed to the front, I will wake up saying I'm going to have a great day, I'm going to be the best I can be, and that's how I start my day. The fourth thing would be to understand the difference between interest and commitment. And this is interesting, right? Because if you have a dream and you're interested in those dreams, Interest will mean you will do everything that's convenient to achieve your dreams. Now, if you're committed to it, you will do whatever it takes. And that's what I did. When I wanted to become a pilot, I told myself, I am committed, and I will do whatever it takes, even if it means dumping that girl. I, I'm sorry, but it, I'm committed to it. I'm so thankful that now I don't have to do it anymore. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I can't. So after doing all that, right, the fifth point would be to mentally prepare to cry. Because yeah, you're doing those heartbreaking things, you will cry. There will be blood, there will be sweat, there will be tears. The sixth thing, yes, to stay away from negativity. Because sometimes people laugh at you, sometimes you look weird, sometimes you're trying to achieve something. Alright? And when people see you doing it, they will get jealous. They will get envious. I remember when I was on the radio, I would have a bunch of followers and, and there will be haters, definitely. For every 1,000 people that like you, there will probably be one or two people who just don't like you, but they'll be so vocal about it. Accept it. It's normal. This is the negative you want to stay away from. Then you would have the seventh point, which is to manage time efficiently and effectively. If you spend most of your time on your phones, working on social media, and I quote, unquote, working on social media, you're pretty much wasting your time. If you spend time on your phones, working to learn something new, doing some research towards your dreams, then you're working more effectively. Point number eight. Prioritize and uh, track your achievements. So this point about positive, you know, literally tracking your achievements is every week, every month, every year, look back at what you've been doing in the past, just, just a few moments ago, to see that are you on track. I remember when I was on radio, I was thinking, is this where I want to go towards being a pilot? I don't have the money yet. What would be my next step? Going to television, which means you have two incomes. Okay, JFK, go and do it. And I did. Always track and check up with yourself. Because if you're on the right track, eventually you probably get it. Point number nine. Oh, this is the best part. Every time you've done all checklists, like being a pilot, you've gone through the entire checklist. You're ready. You're still not given that final clearance to fly. Going over and over those memory items, those, those things you can do again and again in your head if you have to, because they will come to, come to a point you as well, being a student, or right? if you're, you're working towards your dreams, you're trying to achieve something, you've done everything you possibly can. There will be a time when you're like a pilot as well. You're on that runway. All your check is complete. Your seat belts fastened. Phones are off. Everybody's ready to go. There's silence in the air. Suddenly, there will be an option. There will be a command. There will be something that tells you You'll be clear for takeoff. You will be successful, whether it be a job offer, whether it be an opportunity, whether it be a window that suddenly opens. You will be prepared, and your success will, clear, will be clear to take off into the sky. Thank you.